we're talking we'll about. Okay. You, Mr. Sanders. Let's talk Let about me, it. Can I say something? Oh, look, first, first of all, first, 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 let, me go. Go. let me go. I think, Tom, I think she was talking about my plan, not yours. I think we all were right. talking about math, and it no, doesn't take no, two wait, hours well, to do the math. Because let's talk about let's what talk it adds about up to. We math. Don't. Excuse but, me. Can I respond to the Doing nothing is what will happen. Senator Sanders, you are allowed a quick response, and we would like to allow the other candidates. Moderator, guys. Moderator, is my turn? This helps a lot. Thank you. Bernie, I was talking about my <laughs> Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you all with us. The South Carolina Democratic debate was out of control. It felt like sheer chaos with no one in charge, but it was very revealing, especially in the context of the Nevada debate and what lies ahead for both the battle of the Democratic nomination, perhaps also for the soul of that party, and the fall war coming between the Trumpian forces and the Democratic opposition. The chaos may be emblematic of the state of the Democrats as much as it was terrible moderating. So what have you learned from the last two debates? Well, we're going to talk about that now with Marcus Farrell, who is the African-American Outreach Director for, and Southeastern Political Director for Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign, former Deputy Campaign Manager for Stacey Abrams in her bid to become Governor of Georgia, and former Chief of Staff for the New Georgia Project, and currently working as political consultant in Georgia, and joins us from Atlanta now. Marcus, welcome. Good to have you with us. Is it my turn to talk? I was trying to figure out if it's my turn to talk yet. <laughs> no, I'll let you know when that time comes. <laughs> you just did a better job than the moderation last night. That was terrible. My God, that was insane. Um, I don't know. It was really out of control. But I mean, I mean, but here's what I was thinking about that. The chaotic nature of that debate last night, you know, might in real time kind of reflect this fratricidal warfare going on among these Democrats. So let's listen for this one little clip. It just blew me away for a while, which is a crowd booing uh, Warren and Bernie. Mayor Bloomberg has a solid and strong and enthusiastic base of support. Problem is, they're all billionaires. Now, if you look... Oh, dear. Joe has voted for terrible trade agreements. No, 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 no. So, and they booed, you know, Warren as well. It was pretty glaring. Then this morning I read this article in Common Dreams that explained it all, which was that uh, this was an audience full of mostly really wealthy people and politically connected people uh, who paid at least $1,700 in tickets to get in. And then I realized that's happened before. So you've been around this game for a long time. What was that? I mean, Bloomberg didn't have to pay for a stack deck. They gave it to him. So well, let's let's talk about what we're doing right now. First, let me let me backtrack a little bit, then I can get into the booze because what I'm going to say make, should make sense. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Welcome to the South, baby. <laughs> welcome, to the, well, welcome to where the black folks are. I've been waiting for this all year long. No more Iowa speak. No more talking about how I make 41 year old white moderate women happy. Now you got to get down to the dirty South where issues that African Americans give a damn about actually matter, right? So you got to understand something. There are elite versions of everything. There, are, believe it or not, there are very wealthy elite black people. Sure. Right. Sure. And um, and if you're going to tell me that that crowd was a crowd full of the barbershop owners, uh, the brothers who play basketball on the basketball court after after work and after school, the cats who fix your car, the mechanics. Uh, even some of the lawyers and doctors that can't necessarily, won't necessarily pay seventeen hundred dollars for a ticket. I don't think they feel that room. Now, I'm, now I did have a conversation with Jamie Harrison uh, this morning on Facebook, and he and he said to me, "Listen, it was an organic room. Bernie probably could have answered the question differently, but you got to understand something. That might have been a room that was just tailor made to wait for him to automatically say anything that wasn't the way." that they necessarily wanted it to be said. And lastly, like, you got to understand something. There are some people who are part of the de Democratic establishment in the South that still hate Bernie for running against Hillary Clinton. And I say that as the African-American uh, outreach director for him, who I was going to some of these offices where some of the same people are in these offices uh, that took the immediate opportunity to, to take whatever Bernie said and if he didn't immediately go into the answer, he was trying to dodge. And we all know that Bernie actually came back and answered the question, the same thing with Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so let's just be real about what we're talking about here. There is an elite cat. There's a cash system. African-Americans are not a monolith. 
And uh, I don't think that's going to be indicative of how Bernie performs. Joe Biden still will perform well, but a room full of people who are a part of the Democratic establishment booing Bernie, I mean, what else do you expect? Well, there's a couple of things I want to—let <clears throat> me just pick on one little thing you said, not pick on, but hit one little thing you said before I hit this next point I really want to make. So, so you've been, you, you worked for Bernie before. Uh, you're independent now, working for as an independent consultant. So what do you think is at the bottom of Bernie Sanders picking up so much new black support uh, in South Carolina and across the country? Where, where does that come time, from? Time, man. Time. Time. We had time to learn who he was. I mean, you got to understand something. African Americans didn't just up and start supporting Hillary Clinton. They had a 20 to a 25 year relationship with her in 2016 when she ran. Uh, same thing with Biden, right? Biden had gives automatic ghetto pass with some of us because he was he was the first black president's vice president, right? But pe here's the thing: I was on the ground in Charleston, South Carolina, in 2015 with Bernie Sanders. Um, and some of those relationships take time to nurture, uh, especially when you have a, a, a more conservative, more moderate, more, um, I want to say, a, a establishment class literally trying to, you know, red scare black people into believing that Bernie is some kind of communist when they finally get an opportunity to spend five years hearing his message and making sure that it's understand uh, understood. Now, here's the thing. I'm a Bernie fan, and I will always be a Bernie fan, but Bernie had work to do on getting his message of Medicare for all and what that means for black people instead of just it being a class thing. And it's finally starting to resonate because this time around, he's doing a little bit better of a job being like, this is how Medicare for all affects your families. This is what it means when I say college for all. This is how I'm going to make sure that, you're, you're, that black bodies aren't laid on the street uh, because of an unfair criminal justice system and, you know, and so on and so forth. I mean, it took him a long time to get there. And I know, I, Lord knows, I bumped my head with him uh, with making sure that he got there. But the reason why he has newfound support is because it's clicking in time. Nothing about his message has changed in 35 years. We all know that. He's been saying the same thing for a long time. But now people in the South are starting to pay attention to him. Now you're starting to see people in the black barbershops that are like, OK, that four years ago would have been like, what's a Bernie Sanders? To, in comparison to now, where it's like, well, I don't know, Joe Biden, he did the whole crown bill thing. Bloomberg stopped the fresh Negroes. Bernie just wants to get us in college and, and give us some free health care. Those are the conversations that you're starting to hear. You're starting to hear conversations about Elizabeth Warren, and that's the biggest difference. It just takes time mm -hmm. to resonate with African Americans. So let's talk a bit about one of the things you alluded to here, which is one of the things that people think that you could really undercut Bernie with, and it happened in this last night's nice debate as well. And that's attacking uh, socialism, how Bernie says. I mean, America, and it could be effective in this country. So th this is a little piece of, of Biden and Pete uh, attacking. You've praised the Chinese Communist Party for lifting more people out of extreme poverty than any other country. You also have a track record of expressing sympathy for socialist governments in Cuba and in Nicaragua. Can Americans trust that a democratic socialist president will not give authoritarians a free pass? Of course you have a dictatorship in Cuba. What I said is what Barack Obama said in terms of Cuba that Cuba made progress on education. I talked to Barack Obama. Excuse me. Occasionally, it might be a good idea to be honest about American foreign policy. And that includes the fact that America has overthrown governments all over the world, in Chile, in Guatemala, in Iran. And when dictatorships, whether it is the Chinese or the Cubans do something good, you acknowledge that. Barack Obama was abroad. He was in a town meeting. He did not in any way suggest that there was anything positive about the Cuban government. He acknowledged that they did increase life expectancy. But he went on and condemned the dictatorship. He went on and condemned the people who, in fact, had run that committee. The fact of the matter is, he, in fact, does not, did not, has never embraced an authoritarian regime and does not now. Okay. This man said that, in fact, he thought it was he did not condemn what that they did. That is untrue, categorically untrue. Well, I mean, so the, here comes that. But let me play one more very quick clip here for you, just in terms of how this <clears throat> pans out. This is Chris Matthews last week uh, on MSNBC, this whole called Liberal Network, uh, kind of really freaking out about uh, Bernie Sanders. Chris Matthews. I'm wondering whether the, the, the Democratic moderates want Bernie Sanders to be president. 
I mean, that's maybe a, a too exciting a question to raise. They don't like Trump at all. Do they want Bernie Sanders to take over the Democratic Party in perpetuity? Well, I mean, he takes it over. He sets the direction for the future of the party. Maybe they'd rather wait four years and put in a Democrat that they like. This is going to be very frustrating for pundits, very frustrating for media consultants and everyone who's trying to figure this out logically. But there has to be some alternative or we're not going to have a real contest here. Bernie's going to walk away with it. All right. So. Marcus, I mean, this this could be this, this attack could be real both before the nomination and post, if he gets. Um, it. Hey, listen. First, did you notice how um, Vice President Biden was like, "That's my Barack, not yours." <laughs> 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 um, I find that hilarious. Listen, uh, we got to talk about who's what's going to win us this election, man. And I'm tired of centering white moderates. I'm sorry. I'm done with that. We don't win elections with white moderates because if we had a one election with white moderates, then uh, there would be a President Hillary Clinton instead of a President um, uh, Donald Trump right now. Um, let's look. At, let's look at the universe that we need to win. You need African American women and you need African American men, and you need young African American women and young African American men to win and to come turn out at high numbers. If black folks in Milwaukee. If black folks in the Midwest, and by the way, there are black people in the Midwest, if they had a turned out for Hillary Clinton, she'd be the president right now. But she decided that she wanted to ignore them and stick to more moderate tones. And 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 I it, listen, historically, that's what you're supposed to do. Once you get the black people's vote, you just are supposed to pivot to moderate white folks and moderate, and we have to get swing Republicans. There's no such thing as a swing Republican nowadays. So what here's what I'm gonna say about these hits on Bernie Sanders when it comes down to that. Black people don't care about that. Young black folks don't care about what's going on down there. Young people that we need to turn out to actually win this election care about feeding their baby, having a job, not getting killed by a damn cop when you go outside, making sure that we have the lowest, we have the, one of the highest, black women have one of the highest rates of infant mortality in, in, in America. And you think a woman who's having a baby gives a damn about what's going on with what the, these hits are? No, they care about what, you're going to do for them in these policies that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are bringing up, particularly when it comes down to health care, right? I don't have time to worry about, and don't get me wrong, it's very important, and Bernie actually said he didn't support them. They did a good job. Well, if you would tell me where the lie is, and I'm not pro-communist. I don't have anything, want to have anything to do with Cuba, but to be honest with you, if you look at that their health care system, they've been doing a pretty good job with less money than we've been throwing at our health care for a while. And that's just a factual thing. That's like science. That's like real evidence-based stuff here. So if you want to win elections, you stick to the basics. Doing the red scare tactics is not going to throw off young black voters, young people of color, young voters that we need to actually turn out to beat Donald Trump. It might do a little something to black super voters who are a little bit older. But at the end of the day, if they're a super voter, are they going to vote for the Republican? No, they're going to so, vote for the Democrat. So, Marcus, I'd like to ask a totally different question here. I, I was fascinated by what happened with Bloomberg um, in that debate. He didn't do really well. But, but one of the issues here I thought was really great, first of all, the slip he made um, about buying Congress. Let's just check this out for a second. Let's just go on the record. They talked about 40 Democrats. 21 of those were people that I spent $100 million to help elect. <laughs> the, all of the new Democrats that came in and put Nancy Pelosi in charge and gave the Congress the ability to control this president, I, bought, I, I got them. So that's that. And then there is Warren, who I think again did a brilliant job in that debate, um, who told the audience, told the world that uh, they could never, that, that, that the core of the Democrats could not trust and would never trust Bloomberg. Watch this. You said Mayor Bloomberg is not the safest candidate. He is the riskiest candidate. What did you mean by that? I mean that Mayor Bloomberg, uh, let's think of it this way. We're here in Charleston. And uh, you know who's going to be in Charleston later this week is Donald Trump. Uh, he's going to be here to raise money for his buddy, Senator Lindsey Graham, who funded Lindsey Graham's campaign for re-election last time, it was Mayor Bloomberg. And that's not the only right-wing senator that Mayor Bloomberg has funded. In 2012, he scooped in to try to defend another Republican senator against a woman challenger. That was me. It didn't work, but he tried hard. I don't care how much money 
Senate, uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg has, the core of the, Repu of the Democratic Party will never trust him. And the fact that he cannot earn the trust of the core of the Democratic Party means he is the riskiest candidate standing on this stage. All right, so I'm the one choice that makes some sense. I have the experience, I have the resources, and I have the record. And all of the sideshows that the senator wants to bring up have nothing to do with that. Bloomberg does not like Warren, that's clear. And she clearly does like him, and she has some coaching points. And then you had all these mayors, many of them African-American mayors from around the country, uh, coming out to support um, uh, Bloomberg. And then you had these almost, I forget the number, around 100 people who signed this petition out of New York, uh, uh, black folks and Latinos, especially, and some Asian-Americans, saying this is why you should not vote for Bloomberg, because of his racist policies. So talk about how this, you think this is going to play out in this election. Well, first, we have to step back and give... Uh, Senator Warren props for just being as strong as she was on that stage that night. Listen, uh, I tend to trust people in the city that the candidate governed in, right? Um, because you can say whatever you want. And the one thing that I will, and I'm rarely do this, but the one thing I want to give Bloomberg props for over Biden is that Bloomberg stepped into the race and at least had the gumption to apologize for stop and frisk. Unlike uh, Joe, who decided that I'm going to double down on stop and frisk, uh, I mean, on, on the crime bill. So, so if I'm going to back up and look at the trust factor of, of Mayor Bloomberg, he has enough money to create a narrative that is damn near impossible to, to break if you have no idea of what he's done in the past. And there's no counter narrative that is advertising what stop and frisk meant what un uh, unabated capitalism meant, uh, what uh, actually pressuring city council to give you an extra term uh, means when it comes down to possibly winning the president. We are already concerned about Donald Trump not stepping down if he loses or trying to get a third term if he wins. And now we have a candidate like Bloomberg who, let's be honest, I mean, I'll give the Bloomberg campaign props. They picked up some of the best community organizers that were not hired because they had the money to do that. And they are putting them and unleashing them on states that, on Super Tuesday. But the problem with Bloom Bloomberg is very serious. You put a lot of black people in jail and those people are actively campaigning against you, reminding everybody that stop and frisk was a thing and do African-Americans across the country want to possibly be under someone that actually has the willingness to implement police-driven tactics to hurt our communities when we're already the most incarcerated human beings in, the, um, in America right now? Do we allow somebody who is blindly willing uh, to do that to actually have access to the Justice Department? These are real questions that need to be answered. So in going to a different subject here in the time we have, so, so it's going back to Ber Bernie's campaign, uh, he was really pushed hard about the cost of Medicare for all, uh, and there was a huge back and forth with other Democrats. Let's just watch this piece, uh, that, this debate going on in, around Medicare for all. Senator Sanders, the cost of your agenda. Yesterday, you released information about how you will pay for your major proposals. You have said Medicare for all will Over cost a $30 period. trillion. Dollars. But you can only explain how you'll pay for just about half of that. Can you do the math for the rest of us? How many hours do you have? Two. The that's answer that's is, the problem. Talk, no, no, it's not the problem. All right, let's talk about Medicare for all. I'm sure you're familiar with a new study that just came out of Yale University, published in Lancet magazine, one of the prestigious medical journals in the world. You know what it said? Medicare for all will lower health care costs in this country by $450 billion a year and save 68 thousand lives of people who otherwise would have died. Yeah, does the math add up? Uh, uh, no, the math does not add up. The Medicare for All plan alone, uh, page 8, clearly says that it will kick 149 million Americans off their current health insurance in four years. So let's, let's do some math. Senator Sanders at one point said it was going to be $40 trillion, then it was 30 then it was 17 It's an incredible shrinking price tag. Uh, at some point has said is it, it is unknowable to even see what the price tag would be. Now there are new numbers going. I'll tell you exactly what it adds up to. 
It adds up to four more years of Donald Trump, Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House, and the inability to get the Senate into Democratic hands. So this issue here, I'm, I'm very curious because you were inside that campaign for, for that 2016 uh, race. Right. Uh, um, you're outside of it now, but you were inside it then. So I mean, I'm curious about the, the kind of conversations and debates going on because this is one of those issues that can really split and divide Democrats, split and divide this country. Even if Bernie wins the nomination, even if he beats Trump, if that happens, you'll still have a Congress and a Senate that would be really recalcitrant to want to do single payer. You've still got you've got still millions and millions of people who work in the healthcare industry who could lose their jobs. So people can make a lot of arguments about why this is difficult to make work, and that could affect the election. It would seem to me right. There, listen, there's a there's a very big difference. Well, first. You ever notice that people always say, how are you going to pay for it when it comes down to health care? But they never say, how are you going to pay for it when it comes down to war? Um, <laughs> Funny about that. Right. A multi-trillion dollar war machine that could be scaled down in many places. This is just my personal opinion that Bernie's talked about a lot. Um, Bernie presented earlier that day on the CNN town hall, Bernie presented how he was going to pay for health care. Uh, and to be quite honest with you, any major fundamental change is going to cost us a little bit. But if you look at it, when it comes down to your premiums going going down and the, the amount of money that you're going to spend going up and the amount of money that you're going to spend for health care in general by just having health care and being healthier, uh, it's, it's going to be a win-win for Americans. But I'm not here. To, like, I don't want to be pro uh, Medicare for all. I want to talk as an African-American male who has family members and currently literally has to fend for his own health care on his own. Um, black men have the highest rate of hypertension, blood pressure, uh, uh, literally uh, most of the, the, the things that cause his heart attacks, African-American men have the most. What Bernie is doing is talking to a segment of society, super voters who don't have health care right now. And to be quite honest with you, I believe Medicare for all and the general election is going to pull more people to the side for the voters that we actually need to come and vote in comparison to the voters that already have major health care and, and would be as long as he doesn't necessarily take health care away in general. They're going to vote for the Democrat. They're not going to vote for Donald Trump. And to be honest with you, we need to pull out more people that actually beat this guy in, in a general election. So now that you said that, let's look at this. This is Obama. Excuse me. <laughs> this, this this is Trump coming to the uh, to the defense of uh, of uh, Bernie Sanders. I think it was a great win for Bernie Sanders. I hope they treat him fairly. Frankly, I don't care who I run against. I just hope they treat him fairly. I hope it's not going to be a rigged deal because there's a lot of bad things going on, and I hope it's not going to be one of those. So we'll see what happens. But I congratulate Bernie Sanders. So you can look at that and you can think, well, okay, what he's saying is, give me Bernie, I can take him on and beat him. So, yeah. so, so let me set this up and see what your response and your analysis is, having been in the middle of that campaign uh, and also being in the middle of all these campaigns now in this election. So in, in, there were 16 million people who voted for Obama in 2008 who did not bother to vote in 2016. They were just so disgruntled about what was happening. Uh, and then you have the almost 10 million people who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump. And so you and you know this attack against Bernie around socialism and some other things is going to be fierce. And if so, but if a moderate takes it, if Bloomberg takes it, if if Biden takes it, um, then you might have the same phenomenon where people who are for Bernie not coming out. So how do you see Trump losing this election? I see Trump losing this election by millions and millions of young people, of people of color, of young women, of young black men, of young Latino men actually leaving the basketball court, leaving their jobs after they get off work and saying, I'm going to go vote for something that's actually going to have a real true fundamental Why change. do you think that would happen? I, I think it would happen after we get rid of, okay, if Bernie wins the election, there's not going to be a bunch of neoliberal Democrats who are trying to muddy the water with a message. There will be two messages, a Trump message and a Bernie message, right? And that means you have to listen to one of one or the other. Eventually, you're going to have an opportunity to hear an uh, unabashed, unbiased Bernie Sanders message in a general election. And people get to judge that against a probably sort of racist slash misogynist Trump type of message. And we get to compare them against each other. And there's no third way. There's no middle ground. And when people start to hear Bernie's message, he said it 
over and over and over and over again in his elections and in his speeches. This is a movement of millions and millions of people coming together to do the best thing for America. Listen, my grandmother said this to me. I cannot believe a black man, will, I don't believe a black man will ever be president of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Before she passed away, she got an opportunity to vote for a black man and see a black man get elected. But just less than 15 years ago, 16 years ago, we thought a black man couldn't win. And guess what the argument was in the, in the primary then? Can a black person win and actually beat a Republican? And not only did he beat him, he destroyed him. So we don't necessarily know what's going to happen in a general election until it comes. And to be honest with you, more of the same is going to keep those same people who didn't show up in Milwaukee away from the polls in comparison to actually having a different message and trying something different to bring people out and to pull people out and to get them elected and to get, get a Democrat elected. Well, let me just say this. Marcus Farrell, it's been a pleasure to really have you on, on Real News and talk with you. Uh, I look forward to many more conversations with you uh, in the coming months as we cover this election and more. Um, and uh, really great conversation. I appreciate it. But, I'm coming back, man. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great. But I want to leave everybody with this. Now, the other night watching this debate, we know the primary is coming up. We'll see what happens on Saturday, and then we'll have another program on Monday to analyze what happened, and hopefully Mark will be back with us on that conversation as well. But I have to leave you this. When we were watching it, my wife, Valerie, looked at this and said, this line from Amy Klobuchar is going to be a Saturday Night Live skit. I have to leave with this because it just cracked me up. Having someone that can lead the ticket, that can bring people with her, is the way you get gun safety legislation. I look at these COVID proposals term. and say, do they hurt my Uncle Fine. Dick in the deer stand? <laughs> so, for Uncle Dick in the deer stand and us here at Real News, thank you, uh, Marcus Farrell, for joining us. I'm Mark Stein of the Real News Network. Talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.